Hi, I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome to The Fix, the podcast about Lightroom, Photoshop, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we do with our images after the shoot. I'm really looking forward to today's show because I get to have a conversation about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, creativity, and we're going to have that talk with Chris Orwig, a photographer, author, and educator who coincidentally has just published a book on that very subject. Stay with us. It's going to be an interesting show. Well, thanks for joining me, as always. I do appreciate that. So on today's show, I've got my friend Chris Orwig with me. Chris has recently published a book called The Creative Fight, uh, which has a very striking cover there. And um, this book is all about creativity, how to nurture it, how to tend it, how to take care of it so that really you can... Uh, get the most out of it in terms of how it applies to not only your photography, but your life. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Good to have you. Yeah, Sean, this is awesome to be here. Look forward to having a conversation. And I think what will be fun about this is you and I, I think our approach to creativity and to photography so resonates. So, um, at least from my standpoint, it's been long overdue that we've kind of collaborated on something. So excited to get a chance to do that. Yeah, yeah, myself as well. Well, it was great seeing you uh, not long ago, a couple weeks ago. We saw each other down in uh, in the Santa Barbara area. We were both recording at lynda.com, so it was great to, to hook up with you then. And that was like right when your book first came out. And I've been reading it, really been enjoying it a lot. Uh, I really love the uh, some of the photographs that you chose to illustrate the book with. But tell me, just to get us started, what prompted you to um, to launch this venture, write this book, and, and also what prompted you to call it The Creative Fight? Yeah, great questions. So, uh, you know, writing a book is something that takes a while. It doesn't happen at once. But again, I started to think about these ideas and came across this quote by Mark Twain. He said, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And I love that quote. I think it's limiting because it assumes it happens on one day, but we all know it happens in like one day or one week or one month. It happens multiple times throughout your life where you say, why am I here? But anyhow, as I started to reflect on that, I realized going back to being a kid, I once wrote this um, in fourth grade, this little, I created this little book on how to be creative and how to live life to the fullest. And I thought, you know, that's really a lot of what my life's been about. And so anyway, I was thinking about that and then also came across a friend <laughs> who, uh, okay, go ahead. I just have to pause you for just one quick second here. You were in the fourth grade and you created a book on, on how to live your life fully or more fuller. Yeah. Yeah. It was all about like living life to the fullest and, and, and adventures and taking risk and going for it and be, you know, and, and so, yeah. And which, it's, you know, they always say, like, go back to what you enjoyed as a kid. And I realized that's one of these big threads that's been there, you know, throughout my life. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy, you know, and that I always feel when I, you know, there's the definition you have of yourself. And then there's also the definition you have maybe for your clients or for your work. But so maybe one of my definitions is that Photoshop, you know, or photographer or whatever. But the one for myself is I'm just a creative person who happens to do photography or happens to write or happens to teach. And so that's what I, you know, as I really dug in, I was like, this is it, you know, and I want to do something with this. Yeah, right. No, no, that that actually resonates with me as well in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, whatever the art that I do, you know, the images that I make, you know, uh, for most of it, it's 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 with a camera, you know, uh, but not always. Sometimes it's other things. So yeah, I, I really like that. Just sort of identifying yourself, um, you know, at, at the most personal level as just sort of a, as a creative person. But you happen to use photography as your primary means of, of expression. That exactly. And then then that um, I just had started having these conversations with people about being creative, and I had a number of people say, I just ask them like, do you see yourself as creative? And 
majority of the people I would ask, they would say, no, 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 I'm not creative, you know. And, and that was kind of surprising to me because I think we're all creative in different ways. And then one friend who works in IT, he said, oh, I'm not creative like you. Like, I don't make beautiful pictures, or, you know. But then I got to talking with him and he said, yeah, but when it comes to working with this certain type of a router or something, he's like, I'm really, really creative there. And for me, that was it. It's like that we all have these different spaces and places where we can become more creative. And another quick story was a friend, good friends of our son, she, the mom was telling me the story about her son, Andrew, who was born without a hand. And th that story is in the book. But um, just the, as a parent, it's really hard to see your kids struggle with something like that. And, you know, short, shortening the story, basically, he was he's in preschool now, and he can't ride a bike because he just has a wrist here and can't really hold on. And long story short, the parents figured out they could duct tape a cup to the handlebar and he could put his wrist in there and then fly off on his tricycle with his buddies. And it was really, cool. yeah, it's so cool. You know, it, and it, you know, brought me to tears really when she was saying it. And I thought that's creativity and that's the fight, the creative fight as well, which is their solution for, for, for this happened because they were, they were upset. You know, I wish he could, Andrew could bike. They didn't just say, well, no big deal. And then they tr started trying out these different ideas. And the first ideas didn't work, but finally they arrived at one. And for me, that's it. You know, it's making the most with what we have. It's much, much bigger than photography or dance or art or drawing or whatever. And th this creative impulse that we have in us ultimately leads to a better and bigger life. You know, so that's, that was really the idea. And then the last little thought here is that I wanted to write a book which was almost like a journal, which for me was just a way to capture my ideas on the topic. And so I wrote it for other people, obviously, but also I wrote it for myself. And I love uh -huh. the idea of, um, you know, people say, write the book you want to read, make the film you want to see, you know, capture the image that you want to hang on your wall. And so it, it was a passion project in that way as well. Yeah. You know, it, it has that... Um it does have that sense of, of being almost like uh, 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 a flavor of a journal, a personal journal in a way. I mean, obviously, it's it's more uh, polished than that, and it is written for you know the the reader and the greater audience. But um, it definitely does have uh, that sense, and, and almost that that each you know short chapter there represents maybe an epiphany or a discovery or a realization that you had as you were going down this, this uh, path of exploration in terms of, you know, exploring creativity and, and uh, what it meant to you and how it manifested itself in your life. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, that's, that's definitely it. And that it was, you know, I, I once heard, heard this interview on NPR with this person who was talking about this author had written on more topics than anyone else. Um, so he was one of the most prolific authors of all time, but it was on topics, not on number of books, if that makes sense. And anyway, yeah. he was once asked, you know, why do you write books? And he says, well, whenever I want to learn something, I write a book about it, you know, whether it's organic chemistry or astronomy or whatever. And I just thought, bingo, that's it. You know, and the same reason right. I take photographs, right? You know, I want to learn about a tree. So I take a photograph of it. It's not that I know everything about trees and I'm going to, you know, I kind of, it's like a trophy shot and I, I kind of own this, tree. you know, it's more like, what is a tree? What does it mean to stand tall? What does it mean to have branches? What does it mean to have roots? And so anyway, you get the idea. Um, right, so it was right. A real yeah. learning process. And, and yeah, like you said, those little, you know, has 40 of these little mini chapters. They're all like, yeah, this is what I've learned or this is where I've gone um, in order to discover what this means. And, and so I, I do have a question for you. I really enjoy the photographs yeah. in the book. Um, you know, and you have this uh, very striking shot on the cover yeah. uh, of, of yourself with, yeah. with a lot more hair on both yeah. your <laughs> chin and your head um, out in the ocean, I'm guessing, you know, yes. with the Hasselblad. Exactly. A and that theme uh, appears throughout the book. Um, there's the, you know, a, a lot of shots of the water yeah. and the ocean, uh, you know, you in there. So... Um, I, I'm guessing this is just me doing armchair psychology here. D does the the element of the ocean, apart from being just a very you know interesting uh, and fascinating sort of pictorial element in the photograph, does the element of the water represent the 
the forces that we have to struggle against in terms of tapping into creativity or getting more out of it or, or making sure it doesn't get lost along the way. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it basic, you know, and that like the cover for me, you know, being a self portrait was that you have to really be out there and in it. Um, and that a lot of us, I think are passively, even with photography, we kind of passively take pictures, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that could be we're, but we, but when you get in it while it can get difficult, you know, like some of those pictures show. Um, it, it's also amazing and exhilarating and, and things, magic kind of happens in those moments. And so, yeah, and, and I think the sea and the ocean epitomizes that for me so much. Um, also, this idea of journey, of space, of open space. I think creativity flourishes when we have that openness. You know, our lives are so cluttered and confused. But when you're on the water, whether it's, surfing or swimming or sailing or whatever. And I love all those things. You are, you have to be so focused and you know, as right. a, I tell my kids, you can't turn your back on the ocean. We'll play in the waves. And, um, and I have a little four year old and she's learned that lesson. You know, the minute she turns around a wave can just, just swamp her. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think life can do that to us and we right. have to, you know, we have to square off with it. And, and, and when we do, I think that fight can be a beautiful thing. You know, like the, the, the sailor who harnesses this, this howling wind, that, that fight, it can be so beautiful and poetic and wonderful and serene. And so, yeah, so the ocean for me represents so much of that, I guess, in my own life. Yeah. yeah it looks like you had a lot of fun uh, creating yeah. those yeah. images. And, and of course you have a, uh, you have a short little a video piece uh, about the book and it shows video of a lot of that where you're fa yeah. in the ladder, in the water and climbing up the top right, and falling right. off. <laughs> it looked like it was a blast to do. It was so much fun. Yeah. It was, it was great because yeah, I mean the cut, what you're describing, we put this ladder out in the ocean I climbed up on it and then I had to make it fall over. And so that, I had to fall over so many times to get it right, but it was, it was pretty funny. My kids love watching those movies, you know, <laughs> And I'm sure, did, did you have a crowd of onlookers on the beach kind of like wondering, uh, what the heck is that guy doing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people walking their dog on the beach, they were just like thinking, these people are insane, like, what, you know, what is going on? And we're like, oh, it's just a photo shoot or something. And they would be like, all right. But, but <laughs> that gets to a good point, which is what I found is when you claim this idea of being an artist, you can just get away with stuff that the rest of the world can't. You know, it's like, oh, he's an artist. And, and they're like, okay, you know, great. And they're, you know... But, um, or, or they're a photographer, you know, like, why, why did you talk to that stranger? Oh, I'm a photographer. And then, you know, so anyway, that point, I think that's part of our creative fight too, is finding these ways to get, you know, cross that threshold, get onto the other side. And, and I'm sure like you, you know, you're talking about the forest behind your house because you're a photographer, you have a reason to visit that forest in a different way than someone who does, yeah. isn't, does, you know? And so that to me is what gets me really excited about life and, you know, what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see it, you know, not only as, as a beautiful natural space in the trees and sometimes, you know, late in the afternoon, the light shines through the trees in a particular way. That's very, you know, enchanting, but I also see it as, um, and I, I guess I see pretty much every, every place I go, there's a part of my brain that sees it as a potential location to create a photograph. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whether it's just taking a photograph of it as is or thinking more in terms of a stage photograph, hmm, if I brought somebody in here, this would be a really cool place for a portrait or, or some sort of a stage tableau. So, yeah. 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 And it's almost like to me, it's almost like having a dog where if you have a dog, it, like you take it for a walk. And the question is, did the dog take you for a walk or did you take it, you know? And same thing, <laughs> our cameras do that, too. Like they bring me places kind of dragging me by the leash, you know that I wouldn't have gone, like you're saying. Um, and yeah. uh, when you talk about your force, it makes me think someday we have to do a workshop either up there or in Santa Barbara, but that'd be so fun to do one together and, you know, really dig into all of this, this stuff. Yeah. I think well, well and, and also just see, I, I liked it too. Uh, my view and I like to communicate this in my own workshops and my teaching is that, um, you know, the, the, the light may be bad, Right. Um, and, and the conditions may not be ideal. Maybe the weather is not what you'd hope. But I really think that you can make a creative image, creative photograph in any kind of condition. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that it, 
if you want to quali quantify it as being, oh, it's bad conditions for photography, it's because you have preconditions you have created or that exactly. you have uh, uh, erected around the act of photography that says you can only make a photograph if A, B, C, and D are uh, yeah. present. You know, great yeah. light, the, the, the golden light, the twilight, you know, and I think right. go out in any kind of light, go out in the rain, whatever. There are photographs to be made that can be very compelling anywhere at any time. Yeah. I am so with you and I'll probably get some flack for this, but the two most common things I hear is if you want to be a better photographer, they say it's all about the light and stand in front of more interesting things. And I disagree with both of those things. Kind of like you're saying, like, cause for me, it's, it's not about the light. It's about you. It's about your internal soul and your mind and your heart. And like you said, it's how do you make, make do with what you have? You know, that's, I think where you really get creative. And a lot of, you hear a lot of people say, take better pictures by standing in front of more interesting things. And I think it's not about the things in front of your camera. It's more about, you making that thing interesting and finding something there. And so that for me really, at least in my own journey, that's, that's my process, you know? And, and, uh, and I think when you can do that, it just opens up, I don't know, opens up so much that you couldn't have otherwise really imagined. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well then the other thing too, is that, um, um, I think so often, especially maybe when we're working on a, a series of photographs, you know, we want to know what the series is about. We want to be able to say, whether it's in our mind or to, you know, our friends and colleagues, we want to be able to say, oh, I'm working on a series about, you know, whatever, this, sure. X, Y, Z. Um, and, and oftentimes I think that in itself can be, can hold you back because if you're waiting for that, you know, that identifier to be able to say, oh, this is what my series is about, but you don't have it yet, it could sort of, uh, impede you from, from moving forward, from sort of following the muse, even if you don't know where the muse is going to lead. And I, I did a series um, several years ago where I started this, and it sort of grew out of a, a look that I applied in Photoshop, just as a sort of color toning treatment. But it also uh, was just, there were certain aspects of the images that I would take. There was a certain flavor to them. And I, I, after about five or six images, I realized I was kind of imagining those images together. So I knew I had a series, but I had no idea what it was about. So I just called it the series, you know, and, and I couldn't plan it. I couldn't plan. I'm going to go out and work on the series because I didn't know what it was about. And the images were not ones that I could plan. They were images that just sort of happened where I noticed something happening typically with people in the shot and I would react to it in that instant. It was more than a year after I started this unnamed unknowable series that it finally, I finally realized what it was about. And it was really about something very internal and very personal. And then once I realized what it was about, I realized, aha, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so it was a total creative exploration, but I was open to following the path, even though I didn't know where it was going to lead and a year later, I realized kind of what the series was about. And then I could move forward with, you know, a little bit more assurance and confidence. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's a beautiful story because it's, I think it's, it's all of our stories, you know, and that we don't, you don't always know what it's about, you know, and, and even like when you write a book, you know, you, I, I told my editor very early on, I said, I have no idea what this book's going to be about. And she laughed really nervously. And then she was like, you know what? That's Okay. <laughs> Because, it, you know, it's this whole idea, if there isn't a surprise for you, there's no surprise for the reader. And it wasn't mm -hmm. just, let's just rehash something that's old and easy, but let's go to a new territory. And whenever you're going somewhere new, like you were doing in that series, you don't fully know. And you have to be open to that. And that's where I think, going back to your comment about light, if you're imposing these ideas on it, this is what it has to be, sometimes you miss out. Um, you know, obviously you want to have vision and all that stuff, but, um, yeah, I love that story. I mean, that, that really resonates with me in my own process. Yeah. Well, well, the, the other thing too, is that oftentimes if, especially if you travel to a specific destination to take photographs, you know, let's say you, you go to some place to take landscape photographs, you know, obviously we all hope for the great light, you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll get up early in the day to make sure that we're there for the great light, whether it's sunrise or later in the day at sunset. Right. But sometimes things conspire against you and the great light just does not happen. And so you have to sort of, well, I got to make images here. Now I was in Colorado earlier this year and 
you know, we got up early in the morning to be uh, up at dawn at the maroon bells up above uh, Snowmass Village, you know, and we just, you know, we, we got some sunrise light, but there was a, a storm coming in. So the clouds kind of diluted a lot of it. So we didn't get the, the kind of light that maybe a lot of us were hoping for or expecting, but we got great storm clouds instead. So we got something different, but it was still cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and I think, you know, just to kind of add to that is that a couple different parts. There's one imagination. You like imagine the sunrise and everything, and that gets you out there. But then creativity is when you make the most with what you have. You know, creativity is where your actually imagination gets to work. And it's, um, and so, yeah, so having those two sides, I think, are really important. Um, and that it's, it's too easy to get crushed by the time when our imagination, whatever that was, the perfect sunrise, you know, and that image, when it doesn't happen, um, learning how to let go or, or mourn that and find something else, um, you know, to, to shoot or to create. I mean, that's, that's it, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. That's, that's the deal. Well, I, I also think that, that a good exercise, and I do this sometimes in my workshops, is I, I send people out to photograph at the, you know, the, the stereotypical worst time of day to make sure. pictures, which for most people is midday. Right. You know, sun directly overhead, bright, harsh, contrasty right. light, uh, unforgiving in terms of the contrast. You say, go out and make pictures. You know, it, it's, it's not the best time in, according to, you know, these guidelines or rules of photography, sure. but you know, but by going out in those difficult conditions, it forces you to see differently. It forces you to maybe make different pictures or make different choices. And all of that is grist for the creative mill in terms of it is. stuff that you, you may not make, you know, a great portfolio shot that day in those lights, but you might learn a lot or learn to see differently. And that can filter down into the rest of your photography. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that the whole thing of like, you know, discontent, disappointment, all these kind of things or difficulty that, like you said, that's sort of fuel for creativity to kick in. You know, if you have the beautiful light, the beautiful subject, the beautiful, you know, everything's perfect. It doesn't really rev up your creativity as much as, okay, everything's going wrong. I have to find a solution. And I think if you look at like the great stories of all time, it's like someone's trying to solve a problem. They can't solve a problem. They apply ingenuity and creativity and then they solve it. Right. And that's the arc yeah. of most stories. Um, and if what we need to do, I think is enter into that arc and, and allow ourselves to be part of it. Like you said, shoot midday, you know, by all means. I mean, that's, if you want to get good at photography, at least, you know, shoot midday or shoot a wedding. Weddings are so hard <laughs> because everything <laughs> goes wrong. You have no control, right? No control of light, of people, of place, of wind, you know, it, you know, it's like, yeah, you, know, a lot. you really, really learn a lot there. Yeah. Wet, wet, I, I have, uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I've, yeah. I've shot a few weddings, if, you know, small, weddings, big weddings. And you're right. They are very, very challenging to do. And I, I have uh, the utmost respect for people who do it regularly and do it well, because it is, it's a tough situation. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so in, in terms of, of, of creativity uh, and, you know, how we approach it. You go into a lot of things in your book uh, about, you know, taking care of it so it doesn't go dormant and, uh, you know, uh, you know, treating it almost like, you know, a garden where you're, you know, taking care of the garden to make sure that it's uh, in good health and it's flowering and producing, you know, new creative fruit and all that stuff. But um, in terms of the, the photographic process, for me, there's, there's sort of like three different, tiers uh, or areas of, of creativity or, or how I see that that creativity or, or my relationship with creativity is, is a little bit different. So there's the kind of the in, imagination uh, or planning stage where I'm imagining a photograph uh, or planning out uh, how I might make a photograph. Uh, and then just sort of like thinking, well, what do I need to do to make this happen? So there's that creative stage. Then there's the creative stage where I'm actually out with my camera making photographs, whether it's a planned image or just, you know, reacting spontaneously to what I come across. And then there's the creativity that happens in the post-processing phase. And since this is a, a, a podcast that um, 
deals with that aspect of you know the, the the photographic experience i thought we could touch on just some of the you know potential um pitfalls that can happen when you're trying to channel your creativity in the post-processing phase because i think that um you know the tools we have are really great um in order to enhance improve or modify transform our images but in some ways, they can also be as much of an impediment as they can be uh, an open door that leads us forward. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, yeah. And I love how you describe these three different aspects of creativity. And I think the, the biggest challenge, at least for, for me, and I think a lot of us, is to, to realize that the whole thing is creative, right? You know, that, and they're all, it sounds odd, but they're all almost equally important. Like imagination is really important, the actual capturing and creation of the image is really important in the post-production. I was asking one friend of mine who doesn't do a lot of post. I said, how much of that is part of your craft? He said, it's 50% is what is post 50% is capture. And, and if you look at his images, you realize he barely does any post, but it's that final finishing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think part of it's embracing that and then trying to figure out how to, one, not get overwhelmed with it. I think we can be distracted in all those areas. Like imagination can just kind of, you can just keep thinking of good ideas or scanning Pinterest or Instagram and you never do anything. So eventually it's like, okay, no, stop, go create. Mm -hmm. Then when you create, there's the same thing we talked about, like making the most with what you have and just, you know, really being in tune with that. And then in post, the same thing is having that sensibility of, okay, well, what do I do and what don't I do? And the challenge there is to, the, that's where the art is. Like the tool isn't that big a deal. I mean, Photoshop's great and everything, but that's not really the point. The point's the image. And so the, the art is to say, well, how do I use the tool? And how do I do this in a way that resonates with me? And if it resonates with me, maybe it will resonate with someone else. So yeah, so that's, you know, very close and important to me in my own process that I consider kind of all of those things each time I, I make an image. Do you, um, and obviously this is probably different depending on the image and the case and, and the need to the image and whether or not a personal image or, or something you're doing for a client, but do you, um, when you sit down with an image, do you have um, generally a, a, a clear or a general idea of where you want to take it? Or are there times when you're just open to uh, playing around in Lightroom or in Photoshop or, or whatever tool you may be using and just seeing if you discover something by accident and, and that sort of resonates with you in terms of the visual look of the image. Yeah, I think my process is more intuitive. Maybe like you were saying, even in Capture too, I rarely feel like I know what I'm doing. You know, I have ideas and hopes and aspirations, but I'm nervous before every shoot. Um, when I open up an image, often I feel crushed, like, oh my gosh, I, I, this isn't good. But then I have to say, no, let's give it a second. Let me listen. Let me tinker. Let me try. You know, there are occasions where it's like, I know exactly what this image should be, you know, all the way through the process, but that's more rare than it is, mm -hmm. um, the process. So I think, um, if someone were to really like film my process, they would get a little bored. They were like, what's he doing? Where's he going? You know, <laughs> but, but, um, but I give it, I, I found for myself, I have to give myself that freedom and, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, it's not kind of like you were saying with your series photographs, you know, that it's not till afterwards often that I realize the path and, yeah. and that was the best way. And obviously it, over practice, you get to have some ideas with that, but there are, I would say, I don't know what the percentage is, but most of my images, I come to a point where I have, it looks horrible, <laughs> you know, where, <laughs> where I like, I think, let's say it's a portrait of you right now. I can, you know, see you on screen where I'm like, I'm going to remove that poster on the left. Um, and then I remove it and I realize, oh, that was a completely bad idea. I need to bring it back, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And so, um, but just giving myself the freedom to do that, to try that is really, really important for me. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I feel like I'm going on and on, but basically that it's no, less no, to no, figure it, out than more. No, no, it totally makes sense. And, and you know, in terms of tools that, that can make that, um, 
a, an easier path to explore. Like for instance, in Lightroom, one thing that I use a lot are, is the ability to make snapshots in the develop yeah. module because it allows me to totally take the image off on a tangent and it may be not what I expected and it may be a little bit too far, a little bit too kind of out there, but I can you know, make a snapshot and then kind of go back and you know, take it in another direction. Then I have these snapshots that I can go and click on and, and say, okay, well, here's, I've got like four or five different, you know, looks that I've created for my shot here. You know, which one is, is still kind of resonating with me the next day or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And I use a lot of virtual copies, but same concept. Yeah. And that yeah. for me, often it is, I give it a little bit of time. It's very rare that I revisit an image the next day and think, oh, I nailed it. Usually I think, oh my gosh, I didn't see this or wow, that's way too yellow or, um, yeah. And so I think at least for me, it's kind of having a little bit of that breathing room, whether it's using snapshots or virtual copies, or even just giving myself space, working on an image, looking away and then looking, yeah. back. um, that's really important, you know? So, so in terms of that, you know, working on an image, looking away, yeah. whatever, I actually have, have an interesting question that, um, I, I ponder a lot. So, so we live in an age of, of, you know, kind of instant social media gratification where it's almost sort of seems normal or, or at least uh, expected that we come back from a trip or, or a shoot and you know, we work on the images right away so we can process them and put them on Facebook and Instagram, whatever, you know, that, that, that instant gratification, 24-7, uh, you know, connected world we live in where everybody's sharing their pictures right after the event. And I have found for myself, and, and, you know, I, I do some of that. And, and part of that is just because, you know, you want to share what's happening now or recently with people. Right. Like I just got back from this cool trip to where, you know, wherever, you know, I went out to the desert in Death Valley. So here are these cool pictures I took. Right. But I often find that I'm more comfortable with, with my personal images where I actually just sort of sit on them for a couple of months or more. And, and I find that when I go back to them after a couple of months, I find that I do my best work with them after that time period. Yeah. And, it, and maybe it's like I'm, I'm revisiting the trip uh, in, in that sense or the shoot, but um, there's a part of me that kind of re resists that idea of the immediate, you know, processes you can put up on Facebook kind of uh, modality. Yeah. I mean, I so resonate with that. I, even from the, for me, it's distancing myself from the experience of the photograph. So let's say I photograph someone and the guy is just a complete jerk. <laughs> even if the photograph is good, I can't see it as good because of my experience. But then if I give it a week or two, I realize, wow, it wasn't, you know, my, I didn't really connect with him, but this guy had this really interesting internal strength and kind of tenacity and grit and that's in the image and it's good. And, but I couldn't have known that, you know, if I was so close or, or, you know, landscapes too. landscapes, I think are the hardest, but the subtlety of the landscape, you don't realize until later, at least for me. And you realize, Oh, mm -hmm. you know, people say things like gesture when I'm there, I feel the gesture of the trees leaning because the wind was blowing them or something, but it takes me a little bit to realize, Oh, okay. Photographically, that's what's there, not just experientially, if that makes sense. So yeah, I, yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's a really big part of my process as well. Sometimes because of client work, that window is really, really short. Yeah. But I find I can still do that, meaning I, I never just send it. I, I always say like, okay, they need this thing in let's say 15 minutes, which I had one of these scenarios yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to take 10 and then I'm going to wait two, walk away, come back, and when I came back, I was like, oh, my gosh. And there was a couple of things I, I just completely overlooked. And so, but that rhythm of uh, the pause is really important. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's, there's this, I think this quote's in the book, too. If not, it's one of my favorites. But there's this pianist, I think his name's Ar Ar Arthur Schnabel, something like that. But he says, um, you know, the notes I handle as good as anyone else, but it's the pause between the notes. Ah, right. You know, that's, that's where the art is, that pause. Right, and, yeah. And, the, the artists, musicians, poets, you know, whatever, they really are able to deal with that pause, that negative space, that, that time. That's what makes work timeless is, is they weren't just so frenetic and crazy and distracted and going, they paused. And you can feel that in their work. And, and ultimately, 
you know, that's the goal, right? To create something that lasts, not just flavor, right, life, right. but, but yeah. Lasts. So, so yeah, so I resonate. I'm, I think I'm with you on that. And if yeah. I had my brothers, I would always wait. I would never post anything right away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, that, 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 that there can be a drawback to that cause you wait too long and you just yeah, never, never get to it. You know, there's, there's that issue, but you know, let me actually bring up another uh, topic in, in terms of, or at least another uh, side of the same coin in terms of creativity and, and how it, it, um, how it can manifest itself or not in terms of post-processing an image. So you and I uh, have both, you know, been teachers for a number of years, teaching photography and Photoshop and Lightroom. And one thing that I've observed before is that, you know, people can, when they're learning software, let's just say Photoshop, for example, they can, you know, work through a tutorial image, a step-by-step, -step, for instance, and, and of course, the the intent of any step by step tutorial should not be just to sh show you how to do the steps on that particular image, but to introduce concepts uh, and practices that you can apply to any image. And but what I find sometimes is that people, um, you know, when they're new to Photoshop, they can work through a tutorial image, uh, but then when they try to apply those same steps and concepts, you know, they open up their own image. They kind of there's a moment where they sort of freeze, where they're just not sure of where to go. Well, what do I adjust first? What, what does the image need? Um, and, and so I have found that it, it makes sense, or at least for me, it's, it's made sense to look at the image first and just start describing it to yourself. You know, is it high key? Is it low key? Um, how is the contrast? Is it too dark? Is it too light? And, and once you start identifying just these characteristics of the image, you might start to see a, a pathway becoming visible that will suggest ways to go through the post-processing. Oh, but it's a bit too dark. Okay, maybe I need to may brighten it up a little bit. Maybe the contrast is a bit flat, etc. And so by, by, by first evaluating and looking at the image and, and describing it to yourself, that suggests a way forward, whatever post-processing tool you're using. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously strikes a chord because like you said, we're both teachers and we've, we've done this now for a while. And that the, the thing I think, at least for me, you know, and maybe for someone listening to keep in mind is that when you're creating a tutorial, it's a setup, you know, I mean, you've, you've selected the image that's going to work well and you have to do that. There's, I mean, if you select an image that doesn't work well, you can't teach anyone anything, you know, or it just would be really, really long and convoluted, but just knowing that just saying, okay, yeah, <clears throat> they're kind of, you know, this, they're crafting a tutorial in a certain way, but that's different than working on your own images, which is there is no defined way yet. And finding that way is really the art, you know, that is the art of selecting, well, which pathway do I go and how do I process? A couple of things for me that have helped is, you know, to not just learn online, you know, to try to learn in real life and, and, and to sit down with someone because there's something that happens there that can't happen in a tutorial. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I will often, you know, like, let's say, you know, we were to get to hang out, I would say, Sean, well, how would you tackle this? Or I'm trying this. What do you think? And that back and forth is really helpful. And if you don't have access to a teacher, do it with your friends. I mean, people have gut instincts, which are really valuable. My mom, who knows nothing about Photoshop, I'm sure could teach me a lot about image making because um, she just know she's a painter. And so she knows about what an image is and how people perceive it. You get the idea. But anyway, I think that's, yeah that's really big, you know, and, and to realize too, that, um, maybe that finding the path isn't going to be as smooth as it always seems, you know, when we see all the tutorials or I watch, you know, some great photographer presents, you know, and, and when they present, you have to realize they've been shooting for 30 years and they're picking 10 stories over those 30 years that illustrate points. Right. You know, it's, it's very different than being with them shoulder to shoulder and moving forward into unknown territory. And so just giving yourself a little space, you know, that yeah. hey, this is unknown territory. Let's see what happens. I'm going to try this out. Um, I love the idea of talking yourself through the image, just kind of saying, well, what is here? What should I do? Um, and as I mentioned to you before, I have a few images I could show kind of that would share my approach, but I think beginning to 
see that part as an art, like the path making, you know, or, or finding it in the path. It, it, the, the art isn't the tool. Like Photoshop isn't that tough to learn. I know it's big and there's lots of things, but the, the tough part is how to apply the tool. Yeah, and exactly. That's the art, you know. Well, you know, and, and, and just as in, in photography with a camera, you know, it, it's important to, to know how the camera works so that you can right. Uh, right. work with it comfortably in like second nature so that you can react to those yeah. impulses. So, but of course, it, it's not necessarily that that makes the great image. That just sort of helps you make the great image, just like yeah. in Photoshop or Lightroom, being familiar with the... Uh, the tools, uh, the processes that the software offers you isn't what makes the great image, but being familiar with them gets you to that point faster. Yes, I agree. And becoming crazy good at the tool is really, really important. So as far as the technical side, I try to get as good, as fast as, you know, all those things as I can. I think everyone should as well. Yeah. And learn so that, like you said, you, you can then get to the craft and the art and the, you know, of using the tool almost intuitively yeah. Um, versus kind of fighting against it. So, so that is really, really important. You know, I have this, this story. I, I, I told uh, one of my classes once that, that uh, learning Photoshop was like learning to dance. Hmm. And, you know, people like looked at me and like, going, what? And so I told them this story. I said, well, you know, like several years ago, my wife and I took a ballroom dance class. And, you know, initially it was sort of the classic thing where my wife was a lot more graceful and better at it than I was. And I was, you know, like two left feet. I always had to kind of like look at my feet to imagine where they were going to go or imagine those little feet step diagrams that you always yes. see, yeah. you know, showing you this is the basic step for the waltz or the foxtrot or whatever. And, you know, it was always, I was always thinking about it. I had to think about where my feet went first before I did it and it slowed me down and it felt just clunky and awkward. And, you know, after several weeks of practicing, you know, we were just practicing, you know, in, in class and I can't even remember what the dance was, but I suddenly realized, Oh my God, we're dancing. And I don't have to think about, we're just dancing. It's, it's happening. And in a way that's what sort of, I, I mean, I suppose anything, whether it's cooking yeah. or painting, yeah skateboarding, you know, if, but Photoshop is that way too. There comes a time where you just know the tools intuitively enough that you can just sit down and go and you don't have to think about, okay, what's my next step? Right, right. Photoshop is like dancing. I'm going to quote you on that, Sean. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I, it resonates, you know? Yeah. And that's the trick is like you said, kind of having that muscle memory and, and, and that, so you can get to the good stuff because the trick is sometimes I think people think, well, I'm going to get good at Photoshop. So I'm good at Photoshop. And it's like, no, that's not the point. Yeah. The point is, is something even better than that. Um, exactly, and the point yeah. is so that the, the, the tool fades away. You know, you don't even, you know, they don't look at your image and say, wow, you're good at Photoshop or you're great with Lightroom, you know, but they're, they're more, wow, this image resonates or connects or excites or, or did, you know, stirred something in your, in your soul or heart or mind. Right. 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 So we'll tell you what, let's, let's, you have a few, uh, image examples yeah. keyed up to maybe give us a sense of some of your, uh, process about why you made certain decisions in, in doing the edits you did. Shall we take a look at those? Yeah, let's do that. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Let me turn that on. So the first image and what I want to do is just jump through a few layers to kind of get you thinking about how does this apply to actual making photographs? This is the cover of the book and this is a self portrait. Let me just zoom out so you can see the whole image. It's a rectangle, um, but I knew I was, the book's a square format. So I was looking for that square within the rectangle. And let me just show you that the retouching isn't, isn't huge, but if we zoom in, I don't know how well this will, will read, but you can kind of see that first it's just kind of retouching the hair, a little light on the lens. And uh, let me zoom in even further so you can see this better because I know it, it becomes difficult. But you can kind of see it just saying like, well, let's just – actually, there's a weird kind of color cast on the camera too. So I got rid of that, added a little light on the there, fixed up the hair above. Um, you can see that coming in. So it's really subtle stuff and then just darken the hair to mm -hmm. make it so you wouldn't really focus on it and then clean up a few other things. So, so not a ton of retouching. Um, and I don't know if – Sean, can you even really see the before and afters when I do that? Um, yeah, yeah, I can, definitely. Okay, okay. But, but the point being is some images don't need a lot. You don't need to, like, move the guy or make the wave bigger, closer, you know, just – but just 
for me, I wanted this quiet, connected moment in this shot. And then I'm trying to look at how can I clarify that. And there were a few things, a little bit on the camera, a little bit on the hair, a couple little background elements, and that's it. And, you know, Sean, you and I have talked about before, it's really important to figure out the moment when the image is done, you know, where you say like, all right, enough is enough. And you can see in this image, I think that was enough. It looks natural. It doesn't look retouched. And that's really important to me. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because with, with, with uh, Photoshop or, or I suppose really with, you know, with any software, whatever you're using, you know, um, uh, just the, the, the digital, the possibilities in editing images digitally mean you could just be, you could keep going on forever and ever and ever uh, tweaking it and massaging it. And, and there has to come a point where you say, okay, uh, this is it. I'm, I'm done. You know, I could keep going on, but I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and learning how to get to that point, I think is really, um, really important. This is another image um, from the book and um, just kind of the before and after on this one is before you just go back here. You can see, it's this umbrella fell in the ocean. I had a friend holding it. And then the after, just kind of clarifying it, right? This was too bright here, getting rid of the the little part that was coming down from the umbrella into the water. So retouching some of those things away and just clarifying, you know, the vision for it. And like you said, yeah, I could change the umbrella to green. I could make the water purple. You know, I mean, you could keep going and going, but having that sense of, you know, this is enough. Other times I think it's, you know, this is a, a older portrait, but um, for a couple of years ago, it's having vision. This was uh, Kelly Slater, this uh, professional surfer, and it was at this fundraiser. The light was horrible. I had on-camera flash, but I knew what I wanted to do. And let me just show you kind of where I went with it, which was I knew I needed a different background. And so part of it's if you have that sense um, you can capture images with things in mind too. And sometimes that's helpful. Like I knew the background had to change and then I wanted to kind of fine tune the color and tone and the image. And so you see some hue saturation and color balance and curves, you know, nothing that's rocket science, but de definitely something that helps to create a different type of photograph. And this image, actually this layered file I have isn't complete. I did a few more things, but you get the idea of having kind of that vision or direction this is a photograph yeah. from uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, and this is Buddy Alex down at the ocean. And I wanted this really serene kind of picture. Um, I wasn't going to actually pick up seaweed on the on, on the beach, um, but I knew I could I could clean that up, and and so just spent a little bit of time, not a ton, just clarifying that. Then I realized a little bit late in the game that the horizon wasn't level, so I, and there's a part over there I wanted to get rid of to kind of even out the sand a touch and then just some uh, color and tone work to add a little brightness. But the, the point being is that, you know, for me, I wanted this kind of open, airy, refreshing uh, image. And so I'm using my tools to actualize that, you know, again, I could have changed the surfboard blue. I could have, you know, you could just keep going. I could have moved him to a new spot, but I didn't want to, I just wanted to kind of, simplify a little bit. And I think I have maybe one more. Um, this is a portrait of the musician, Ben Harper. And I've, I've, I don't think I've ever shown the before and after this before. Um, partially because the original image isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is. Here's the original capture, right? Um, it was just, I had, a, I had a small moment when I was photographing him, capture the image. The light isn't that good. The exposure isn't that good. But I started to kind of process it. You can see I wanted to have it have this uh, kind of a more authentic type feel. This is, yeah. feels a little heavy handed. It's not that great. But then finally, it's like, okay, yeah, no, that you're connected with his eyes. The eyes are really important to me in portraits. And so you get um, what the retouching is there, color and tone, and then also just working away some of the shadows you know, underneath the eyes, little shadow on the nose, brightening it up, making it a little more high key. But for a portrait like this, it connects you more with the subject than does this. And so, right. so again, it's nothing I've shown here in all these images just going through. I'm like, this is like clone stamp and healing and maybe some curves, you know. This is just uh, clone stamp and healing and curves, you know. And then um, this is the same kind of thing with some masking. And, you know, this is the same kind of thing with the same kind of thing, I guess. And then same approach. So point being is that it doesn't have to be – 
you know, your, your post-production to make great images, sometimes it requires a lot of work, but sometimes it's these simple little adjustments which can get you there. Um, the challenge, of course, like you were saying earlier, Sean, or it was to uh, learn the tools really well so that you can get there quicker um, rather than having it have to take all this time. Right, right, yeah. No, those are good examples, particularly that last one of the portrait. It really does... Um, you know, almost comes across with, with almost a, uh, a studio type, yeah. uh, look to it. It's got a real yeah, clean kidding. look and everything. Yeah. I mean, that's the yeah, no. last 100%, but yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and you, you know, sometimes it just doesn't require a, a lot to start off with an image that's in one state and, and just take it in, you know, uh, some subtle directions and, and really, you know, discover something along the way to where you, you have an image that, uh, you know, may have what you regard as deficiencies in terms of not being the perfect uh, conditions to make the photograph, but you can actually, you know, through uh, post-processing, uh, improve that and take it to a place where it really does start to resonate with you on a creative level. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that was, uh, it's just so great to, to talk about that. I'm sure we could just keep going on for hours and hours. We'll have to get together next time. Uh, I'm down that way and uh, continue the conversation. Yeah, let's do that for sure. I think that'd be a lot of fun. So Chris, tell people uh, where uh, they can find you uh, on the internet. Uh, and I know also that you have a, a new uh, audio podcast uh, centered around the book. So uh, give us the information on that and we'll be sure to put the links uh, uh, in the show notes for this show. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, so just my name, which is Chris Orwig and chrisorwig.com. I also have a site for the book, which is The Creative Fight, so thecreativefight.com. And that's where the um, I'm starting this year-long uh, podcast for that book. So it's a, sort of a focused five minutes each week of inspiration. And other places, Instagram, it's just at Chris Orwig. Basically, if you search for my name, you can find all those things. And then um, as we mentioned too, I have a ton of stuff, tutorials, you know, that we've both done for lynda.com and lots of courses there that I actually have to go in tomorrow to record another one. But, uh, but yeah, so there's, you know, if you're curious about post-production, whatever it is, as far as Lightroom and Photoshop um, and some other tools, there's, there's some tutorials on there that might be helpful. Yeah, many, many very helpful tutorials if you want to learn the nuts and bolts of, of moving the levers and turning the dials in, in Photoshop and, and Lightroom. Uh, and then your book, of course, is uh, a great resource uh, and also a very inspiring resource I found in, in reading through it just for uh, maybe giving people ideas for how they can you know, better channel and nurture uh, creativity in, in their own lives, not just photography, but also just in their lives in general. So good yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. In the book, I, I, have, a, I have three daughters, as I was telling you, but I've been talking with my youngest daughter who's four and I told her her name's Elsie. I said, Elsie, if my book sells well, we may get to go to Disneyland. So, um, <laughs> so if you buy the book, you're supporting a trip to Disneyland. And so she's starting to market it for me. She'll tell people, you know, people say, oh, okay. they'll say, Chris, congratulations on your book. And, and she'll come up and say, you know, my, if my dad's book does well, we may get to go to Disneyland. <laughs> so she kind of seals the deal for me. I wish she was here with me in my arms or something, but, um, but yeah, no, um, Boy, that's... I, I hope, I hope you, you guys do check out the book. It's a real passion project for me. And uh, I think there's a ton of inspiration in there and some practical advice to you on how to, how to live these more creative lives that we want to live, you know, and, and create great work too. So. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's a hard sell there. Yes. The whole Disneyland thing. <laughs> 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 well, I, I know I'm definitely enjoying the book and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, m moving forward. Uh, through it. So, so thanks again for coming on uh, to discuss all this. All right. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of The it. Fix. Uh, thanks again, as always, for tuning in. Remember, you can um, subscribe to us on iTunes, the audio only version of The Fix, or you can check out the video version as well as a downloadable audio version on the website at thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. I'm Sean Duggan. We'll see you next time on The Fix.